Oh, it's going slowly. It's going. Awesome. Okay. And we'll go ahead and start the recording. Awesome. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Poets in Pajamas, episode 158, uh, with the wonderful poets featured being Norino Campo and River Ying Dandelion. Um, we will go right on into beginning the reading, if that's all right with everyone. Um, if you need a copy of the poems for accessibility purposes, please reach out to us at poetsinpajamas at gmail.com and we'll get those copies sent over to you. Um, with the Zoom integration, there is also a, a speech to text function that you can use if you need as well. Um, each poet will be reading for about 15 minutes and then we'll finish off with a Q&A from both poets at the very end. Um, feel free to use the chat function to shout out lines that you love or throw encouragements to the poets as they read too. Um, and we'll also have links for all of the poets info joining in the bottom. Um, so without further ado, um, Noreen Ocampo is a Filipino American writer and poet from Metro Atlanta. Her collection, Not Flowers, won the 2021 Variant Lit Microchap Contest and her work can also most recently be found in Maria's at Sampaguitas, Tramp Set and Rejection Letters. She holds a BA in English from Emory University and currently studies poetry in the MFA program at the University of Mississippi. Noreen, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much for that intro, Aslan. Um, and thank you all um, so much for being here. Um, Dad, can you please mute your camera? <laughs> Dad, please mute your camera. <laughs> okay, he got it. He got it. Um, maybe. Okay, it's okay. Anyway, <laughs> um, thank you all for being here to listen to some poems. Um, thank you to Aslan and SJ for organizing this. Um, River, I'm so excited to be reading with you today. Um, I'm going to read for about 15 minutes and I'm going to read some of my newer poems um, that I wrote this semester. Um, I just finished my first year of my MFA program um, and um, these are some of the poems that I've been working on. Um, so for the first section of my reading, I'm going to be reading poems where all the title is um, There Are No Filipinos in Mississippi. Um, so it's a running title, so I'm just going to go straight into the poem each time I read. Um, but each poem takes place in a different location, which I won't necessarily say in my reading, but um, if you want to check out the transcript, you can look at the different locations um, if you're interested. But um, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the reading. Um, the first poem, um, all of the titles are, there are no Filipinos in Mississippi. Um, and here's the first one. There are no Filipinos in Mississippi, except for the two women arguing by the dumpster. Tamana says one, just take it. She shoves Tupperware full of something delicious into the other's hands. The second woman pretends to get into her car, pretends she's ready to leave. This waltz will last for at least another hour. I want to join them. I want them to see me in my chinelas, another short girl struggling to hurdle a trash bag into the bin. I want to tiptoe into that Tupperware and tell them I recognize what I see. Want them to recognize me, say, I look just like a cousin from back home, the one who used to sing sad love songs at every party. I want to pass the mic and say, no, Ate, you can have the next one. I've been singing by myself all night. Um, so just for some context, Filipinos really like karaoke. And the first thing I did when I got home after eating actually is sing karaoke on the machine that my dad brought us recently from the Philippines. Um, so I was excited to include that in that first poem. Um, some context I'll give for the second poem is that um, in Oxford, Mississippi, where I'm currently attending grad school, there is this one intersection um, called J on, on Jackson Avenue that is incredibly impossible to cross as a pedestrian because there are crosswalks, but like there's a button that you press to cross, but not the actual sign that tells you when you're supposed to walk. So it's um, it's very difficult to be able to tell like when you can actually cross. Um, so I wrote this poem kind of about that crosswalk or that intersection. There are no Filipinos in Mississippi, but when there are, we're crowding the sidewalk at the impossible intersection, all six of us, while the five of them and the one of me, watching from a hazy window of the blue west, screeching to a stop. I know the cars here are relentless and unyielding. The guts of the pedestrian button spill out from the pole. 
The five Filipinos glance at each other, their faces like my face, searching weeks before for a kind pair of eyes in the cold. Their hands know there's one way to cross. They reach for each other's fingers, their wrists and sleeves, readying to move as one. I watch them flood the crosswalk, this impenetrable body cresting to full speed. Um, I think just three more poems um, for this first section of my reading. Um, but for this next one, um, the context or the backstory is that it's incredibly difficult to get Asian groceries in Oxford, Mississippi. We usually have to go all the way up to Memphis um, for the Asian grocery stores there. But um, during my first semester, some friends and I heard about a grocery store in the neighboring city Tupelo. So we all drove over there and I was really excited to see this brand of Filipino ice cream being sold. But the thing is that it was being sold for $14.99 and I was like shocked and so I wrote a poem about it. Um, and here's that poem. There are no Filipinos in Mississippi. No one to buy the mango magnolia ice cream for $14.99. No one to pause and exclaim, what? Isn't this the magnolia state? No one to provide a price comparison to Seafood City or Manila Mart. No one to brainstorm what exactly the gold label claims to mean. No one to prop open the glass door and shiver beneath the weight. No one to contemplate the severity of third degree freezer burn. No, no one to hover fingertips over the crystallized ice and press deep. No one who knows how the mangoes survive this lonely cold. Um, and this next one is a duplex. Um, I really like duplexes for some reason, um, but as you can probably tell, the buses in Oxford are um, kind of central to my experience there because I unfortunately cannot drive. Um, and this is just another poem about my experiences taking public transit in Oxford. There are no Filipinos in Mississippi, so the man on the bus asks, why are you here? On the bus with the man, I'm here, but my body lurches into the window. A heavy boot hits the gas. The hard window cradles my head. Outside, the branches tremble. The man cocks his head. My hands tremble. In the South, winter comes out of nowhere. I know the South. The man comes out of nowhere, salivating for the islands. Where were you born? Salivating for the islands, I wasn't born anywhere too far from the Magnolias. All too far from the Magnolias. There are no Filipinos in Mississippi. And then this is the very last um, poem for at least this first part of my reading. Um, my The people in my workshop like this poem the best, but I think I'm still kind of working on it. Um, but the backstory for this one is that um, during my first semester of grad school, a lot of my classmates and I really liked going to this one beer place in Oxford called The Growler. Um, and we would go there pretty frequently, but one time we went there, I saw that there was a new bartender and then we both eventually realized that um, we were both Filipino. And I suppose I have now spoiled the poem, but that's just the context um, behind why I sat down to write this one. There are no Filipinos in Mississippi, but the new bartender has suspicions about me. He considers. Maybe it's the new moon nostrils, the rounded shape of my face, or the way I look at him, wondering too. Certain sweetness trickles down my glass as he pulls away from the tap, his hands steady like brown boys on skateboards, like my brother when he has something to say. I hold out my credit card, a late invitation. Ocampo, he reads, as if it's the easiest thing he said all day. Then we're laughing at each other. It's Thursday and the night is still ours to kick through. We aren't worried about our elbows, knees, or parents stalking the cul-de-sac, shouting for us to come home. Um, so that's the very end of what I have so far for this, um, this group of poems. I'm hoping to work more on um, this sequence over the summer, but um, I've currently run out of Filipinos in Mississippi to write about, so I'm hoping to run into some more soon. Um, but the next couple of poems I'll read are um, a little bit newer. Um, if you were in the Zoom room, you saw my dad very briefly. Um, and these poems are um, some of the first poems, or these are the first poems that I ever wrote about him. Um, but he's been really big on storytelling. So I feel like these poems have just kind of been like bubbling up perhaps throughout the majority of my life. Um, so this next one is a little bit longer. Um, so if you can access the transcript, um, that might help. Um, but it's called Zuhitsu with Lessons from Dad. Empty cans make so much noise. When you drop a full can into the street, it is silent. At the beach, I am one of many children with a kite, but the way mine hits the air defies magic. 
Only my father knows the trick. Our silver purple fish takes the sky and flies like it was meant to. Then he passes the line to me. A man's ears will ring long after he has left the mines. My father motions for me to roll up the car window. Come to the dinner table without the day's baggage. Eat with a smile on your face. On Palm Sunday, no other man in church knows how to fashion a grasshopper from those slim leaves. Every child leaves mass holding palm crosses of varying intricacy or palm sharpened into a straight sword. My sword takes the shape of lightning with infinite angles and bends. Duende can live in the drain, say, bare, 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 before pouring hot water. If their skin scalds, so will yours and no remedy will heal the wound. You will have to apologize, set out oil and ask for their blessing. My father crouches in the closet and pulls out a heavy case of rocks. Igneous, sedimentary, pumice is light as air, cratered like the moon. I squat in the cul-de-sac to sift through slit, silt trapped in slits of the asphalt. I always tumble over that. Unearth five shards of colored stone, cloudy glass. Each grain of rice is money. Do not let a single one fall. Do not bring the rice pot to the rice sack in the pantry. Leave the pot in the sink. Scoop rice with a plastic cup and steady your hand. Make the walk from pantry to sink without spilling. On the side of the fridge, a photograph of my father and his coworkers in a line, all in button up shirts and ties. My father slacks with the neatest crease ironed down the center of both legs, a foot between the crown of his head and the blonde man beside him. My father's pose like Superman. My father sells my seat at the Braves game because I'm young enough to fit in his lap. I watch the white uniformed men jog from base to base, slide into the red clay and spit into the perfect grass, a little taller than usual and still and quiet. The best brand of jeans is Levi's with its stiff American denim. Even if you have to trim the pant legs by a few inches and learn to sew, the extra steps are worth it. My father before he was my father with a car fast enough to wake the barrio his laughter whistling from too many beers. He falls asleep in the tall grass behind a cousin's house, wakes to the sting of ants feasting on his skin. We visit Mr. Kim at the car dealership on Sunday after church. My father leaves me in the car, says he'll be quick. I tremble in the back row, my stomach to the carpet, head tucked beneath the seat. Do not sleep at night. Do not shower at night or sleep with your hair wet. Do not sleep without at least one light on. Blue crabs sit in an inch of water in the sink, still alive. My father forgoes silver tongs to reach into that shallow pool, then pointed claws around his finger, his hands slicing frantic arcs in the air. Live with your head, not your heart. My father is not quiet. He laughs loud as an empty can pinwheeling down the sidewalk. My father sells the most flat screen TVs at Best Buy and wins the Christmas employee giveaway for me, a red and silver scooter with a back pedal that goes fast. I careen down our driveway on my new gift, my father steering and my hands gripping the handlebars, my palms beneath his. If you're leaving the house, if you're ending a phone call, don't say goodbye, say see you later. That's the end of that one. Um, one more poem about my dad and then I think I'll finish with my newest poem yet. Um, thank you for the emojis and the Zoom. <laughs> um, but the title of this one is When You're Older, I'll Tell You a Story, which is a which is something that my dad often repeated to me in my youth. So I spent a lot of time like waiting for this one story. Um, and I'm I, I think he's told it to me, but it's it's been a little bit unclear. Um, and so that story, because it's really personal to him, is not in this poem. Um, but I did commence with his words. So when you're older, I'll tell you a story. Tell me about typhoon season. Tell me about the bamboo and the bee you trapped inside. Tell me about sprinting with a knife. Tell me about the Irish nun at the piano, her sharp ruler and your small hands. Tell me about squatting in front of the classroom, biting hard into chalky bar soap. Tell me how many pesos for banana cube, for the jeepney going home. Tell me about salting your sleeping sister's open mouth. Tell me about your father's loud bakery and silence at the table. Tell me about hushed laughs with your mother when he went to bed. Tell me about my mother, how she looked at you when you met. Tell me about your first love. Tell me about your second love. Tell me how much you drank behind the church, how many cousins were there. Tell me about them getting married while you gave everything to your first shiny car. Tell me how you fed it new parts, how you lived to drive fast. Tell me about the night, the drunk man and the gun to your head. Tell me you got away. Tell me you got home. Okay. 
And so I am now at my final poem. Um, I was worried that I wouldn't be able to write anything this summer because I want to work on both of those, like two different groups of poems, but um, I haven't been able to really find the right direction that I want to go to. Um, but I've been helping a lot of friends move recently. Um, and so I wrote a poem about that. Um, and I also thought it would be nice to end on a love poem. Um, and this is Moving Season. In the morning, my arms would be sore too tender to fully straighten. I had spent the weekend passionately swiffering our friends' emptying apartments, the two of us waving goodbye to piano-heavy U-Hauls and silver Jeeps rattling into the glassy hour before sunset. But the real culprit must have been my deadlifting form, my desperate battle with boxes swollen with our friends' cherished belongings. Though you praised me for my strength, though you made sure to carry the heavier things. It was dark by the time we finished a slow dinner at the nearby Chinese restaurant. The easy walk home, even easier with you slotted between me and the occasional fast car. I was tired and, I confess, a bit delirious with the irrational sad I can usually stomach. A flimsy version of me you had not seen yet. Sometimes it's difficult to be alive, I said, and in the same breath, sorry, I get like this sometimes. And you reached over, saying nothing, easing the to-go container of noodles from my fingers, gentle as you lifted that small weight from me, warm as you took my hand. That's the last one I have for today. Thank you all so much for taking the time to listen to some poems, either on the live stream or um, after this being posted, um, but this was super fun. Wow. Again, still smiling. It's so sweet. Thank you, Noreen. That was such a wonderful reading. Um, River, if you're ready, we'll also move on right away into some more astoundingly talented good poems. Uh, our next reader is River Ying Dandelion, who is a keeper of ancestral medicine and memory through writing poetry, teaching, and creating ceremony. He writes to connect with an unseen and unspoken so he can feel and heal. River has been awarded fellowships and residencies for his writing from Tin House, Lambda Literary, Kundaman, Asian American Writers Workshop, Vona Voices, and more. His work has been nominated for Best of the Net 2022 and is published in Best New Poets 2021, The Offing, The Margins, Asian American Journal of Psychology, and elsewhere. He was recently awarded the AWB Kurt Brown Prize for the title poem of his poetry manuscript. River is a water lover and has performed and presented his work globally from the Dodge Poetry Festival to the University of Havana. For more, visit riverdandelion.com. River, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Aslin and SJ for organizing this um, to the team at Sundress. And also, Noreen, those poems were so wonderful. I was smiling throughout and I felt like hearing your work um, just made me want to write more stories. So thank you for that. It's an honor to be here. And I want to start with a poem called Oral History or Mama's Retelling. And for context, Mama means maternal grandmother in Cantonese. Oral History or Mama's Retelling inspired by Eve Ewing. We were running, always running during revolution. My closest neighbor, then my parents with my brothers, without me. The youngest won't remember this trauma, they said. My own grandmother, unwilling to leave without her possessions, rosewood chairs, vanity mirrors, porcelain wares she could not bear to be without. By the time she was ready, there was no leaving. I burned the rice on the stove top each time. Without a mother, there was no one to teach me. Those years overcast. One day, I grew weary. I decided to fly. It was unexpected at first. Slicing scallions for dzok, I suddenly felt my pinky wiggle. My toes lost their magnetic grip on the tiles. My whole body pulled me towards the window terrace. We kept bolted. The latch jolted. Even the pans wobbled to bid me on my departure. Before my grandmother woke, I was out, soaring above blue tarp canopies, beyond the street peddlers and veggie vendors. Now, don't be fooled. Flying isn't easy. 
I was fumbling, kerpumbling, reaching back to the balcony's ledge, but the wind said, no, go. I remember the longan trees, waved their arms, rejoiced wide. I was moonwalking above branch tops. Below me, they looked like any old shrub. Can you believe it? Even the trees were smaller than me. I wondered if they would fruit next season. Far from the cacophony of the radios, I smelled eel sizzling from sky. And your grandmother, your mother's mother in the next town over, headed home from the fields with a bucket of taro, she too 16 and shining, bobbed hair beacon star of the town, about to drop her goods with the rice husk sack slung across her shoulders. I blew a cloud over her head for cover. With my gentle knees, I kicked the spirit out from hiding and sent them to soften her shoulders. With her muscles relieved, she looked up to thank the gods and only saw a black bird, my shadow. Um, that piece uh, to me, I think a lot about how in poetry we can not only document history, but also rewrite it. Um, and reimagine uh, what wasn't uh, in order to kind of like lift the burden from memory sometimes. Um, and that poem is in my newest chapbook that is forthcoming, which is also very big news. And the second piece, um, I was happy I chose to read this today because I feel like it is related to Noreen's work too. It's called My Mother's English. My mother's English blends D's into T's. God becomes what we had, an offering. She doubles the J's in orange juice. My sister and I get two servings. The R's and the L's infamously mirror each other. Partner dance, sachet across the tip of tongue until they become one. I come from a people who need not learn a colonizer's tongue in shifted lands. My people create neighborhoods of languages where aromas of noodle soups transport tasters back to home places never stepped foot in. My people ask, have you eaten yet? Like the question will guarantee longevity. We string well wishes of good health and prosperity onto each other like garlands if worn long enough could transform circumstance. My people sell cuttings of backyard greenhouses for coffee money carefully wrap rounded plant pots with last week's newspapers for safe passage. We bless tabletops with peonies and gladiolas, purple chrysanthemums and orchids, make conniving spirits vanish. My people celebrate New Year's for two weeks because beginnings are that sweet and our ancestors and spirits welcome all the time we can give. Nothing is afforded. We can be Ai Fong like the gifts we give need not come back. It's that we have to give that we give. We cleanse stagnant energies, wave mops in four midnight exercises. Our children throw small firecrackers on sidewalks, like the pops will scare bullies away too. My people knew of the pandemic before it hit my country. We wore face masks when the government said it wasn't a good idea. My people run from the spitting. My people run from the hitting. My people wear masks selling veggies from local farms. 79 cents a pound for you toy. Profit not exorbitant. My people ask if I bought enough string beans when the fresh strands rubber banded together don't quite reach a pound. They are surprised I live alone, not seeing how one can be family. This next piece is called Introduction, and it was just published in Room Magazine. Um, I wrote this piece a while ago, actually, and I feel like it's been on a journey with me because of the number of times I've submitted it and how long it took before it was like formally published. Um, but I think throughout, I've like celebrated this poem anyway, um, and so. This is titled Introduction. Introduction. Here, we change our name when it feels right. We come together by life's path, not age. People concerned with ancestral healing, death, lactose intolerance. 
We use pronouns of animacy and inanimacy, not masculine and feminine, like how Robin does in Potawatomi. We smashed all clocks in the world, threw debris into compost machine, found time in rice field terraces of our fingertips, stopped measuring progress like flowers. Bodies grew to redwoods. We don't have many words for becoming. Brilliance transferred to paper aren't drawing. Stories need not make you writer. Bud blooming to flower, just another stage of metamorphosis. We let ourselves be. Listen to each other, how we listen to rising tides in conch shells. Cradle body gently. Let vibrations thunder soft unravelings. At night, we hug our bodies. Whisper, good job today. Remind ourselves you are tumultuously soft like ocean, fauna of life, crackling coral of wonder. You, sleep comes easy. Children, geniuses from small, know how to intuit and grow safety young. We stopped hurting as much, buried rage into soil, dissipated anger into atmosphere. After the universe scattered, we searched and found each other fell into mutual gravitational force, returned in waves like Nayira said how water loves. Here, there are no instruments. These palm lines, strings of guitar, vocal chord symphony, rhythmic heartbeat song itself. Here, we produce our own light, store and summon it in our bodies, incandescent like plankton. This next piece is a villanelle. Um, and so you'll just be hearing me reading it instead of seeing it on the page. Um, but the lines are just repeating and um, it is called Unreported. <clears throat> Unreported. I'm beginning to think the news doesn't matter. Blank book, burn book, singe scar ignited. History knows what it did. Empire knows where it's going. The same stories rerun to cause fear and psychological terror, human mind malleable, paid warfare controlled. I'm beginning to think the news doesn't matter. What's committed gets erased, what's erased called forgotten. Historical amnesia, a people blame themselves. Growing bushfire leaves evidence only in ashes. History knows where empire is going. I scavenged the records to scour. Bleached pages, bitter stares, blanks, conquerors buried in banished histories. I'm beginning to think the news doesn't matter. What I deem breaking. I'm finally dancing. I rescued myself from the flames. My scars, new spines of books igniting, evidence in risen ashes, history knows empire is going. News anchors call me stoic, my face a learned mask, solitude sanctuary not for taking. Citrus flowers bloom bouquets of lemons at my doorstep right now, the news doesn't matter. I soak their rhymes in honey till history is empire evidenced only in ashes. I'm gonna impromptu actually pull up a poem that I feel called to read right now. And this poem is about a moment with my grandmother and um for me like in my poetry delving into stories of family um stories of home oftentimes it's just really heavy and there aren't always moments of that joy or that peace and so when those moments come i think i really hold on to them and kind of like cherish them for as long as i can Dancing with my grandmother. 
Yesterday, I danced with my grandmother for the first time. We dusted ash off our collars, let Ngo Sang Ta's fall away. She turned to me 180 degrees, Cantonese pop songs playing on TV, angelic singers from a generation of wanting. I, recently returned home with new life in my bod, made the first move. She looked at me as if she was five, and in my hands, hoi pings, bodoi fans, a smile, then a shimmy, she began. Her footsteps mirrored mine. My shoulders emulated hers. Joy blossomed over her night-blooming eyes, petals reaching for moonrise. Time stopped. Just the two of us, eighth notes, swaying and swaying, beams outbranched. I can sing. I can dance. Gosando across green carpeted stage, everyone tells me I can. We rest in 4 4 time. The cadence of can reaches my own lips. Yes, you can. The cans in Ngonang, Ngohoi, sachet all the way to stained glass window panes across Marble Island, chilled rose milk tea, sauteed cauliflower, juiced paper plates, our audience. For once, this was not a metaphor, but poem dancing with my grandmother. For the first time, we were two trouble clefts falling in and out of each other's time signatures, two musicians composing sonatas in each other's movements, two cellists carrying the orchestra all the way home. And this last piece, this last piece, um, which recently came out in Bellingham Review, is called Spell for Trans Safety. And I dedicate it to all of the trans, non-binary, two-spirit, genderqueer people um, who are in the Zoom space and listening on Facebook Live and listening in a future from now. Um, thank you for joining us. Spell for trans safety. May you know yourself in a world of noise and confusion. When voices berate and anglicize, remember your rudeness. With each stomp like toff, shake centuries old rage off you, begin anew. May you know hydration. Remember your cells are made from the same water that courses river, the same rivers that jade mountains, the same mountains our people tended and traversed to arrive where we are today. May you know what it feels like to be loved at your saddest. May a friend catch you, hold you close, remind you you are light despite what you've been told, the mirror is not broken. Find your reflection in their eyes. Let dovetail embraces soothe cold memories. May you stand taller. Know the past is a past you no longer need to hold. When beguiled beast comes clawing and neck to your boundaries, shield yourself with gravity, defying waterfalls, wind up and around you. Know you have it within you to do this. May you know who and where and how you are is more than enough, is magic is everything. May you know anger. The violence enacted on your bod is not one you need to downplay or pretend is not there to survive. Interpersonal slashes and transgressions, actions warrant reactions. You need not sit still and smile through pain. Even when it is not safe to express your rage, feel it. When you are alone, in the presence of ancestors, shake your arms, then legs, your hips, then your whole bod. Give yourself permission to tantrum. There is nothing more ancient than anger released, nothing more freeing than anger released. How else do you think we have survived all these years? And when the feelings subside, as feelings come and go, let the exhales of your breath meld with mist. Bring yourself back to a you you have been forced to forget, light incense. Call in forces beyond. Forget what you don't have. Wipe the shelf corners, clean grime off porcelain cups. It's time to return to who you thought you could never be. I ask you 
through this song. Stay here with me. Thank you. Thank you so much for that river. Oh, immense, immense poems. Um, what a sweet, almost like devotional way to end off the reading too. That's, uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, we'll now enter the Q&A portion of our Poets and Pajanas 158 here. Um, if y'all want to summon questions to ask our wonderful readers, you can throw them in the chat or you can unmute and ask yourself. For those in the Facebook, you can throw it in the Facebook chat and we can uh, transport it here for you. Um, as you're thinking, I have a question that we'd like to start out with for our poets, which is just, what have y'all been reading recently? Whoever wants to go first. So I'm currently trying to get through, I have a, I'm sure we all have this problem, but I, I buy too many books and then I'm not able to read them all right. So summer break just started for me and I'm like, this is the summer that I'm going to read all of them. Um, so I just finished reading um, Swan Hammer by Maggie Graber, who just um, graduated from um, the PhD program at my school. Um, definitely, definitely recommend that book if you haven't picked it up already. And I just started, um, I'm, I wanted to read a little bit of fiction for some time. So I started um, one by Jenny Zhang, I believe. And the, the exact title um, escapes me right now, but it has sour in it. Um, and it's it's really good. Um, I, I'm just in the first couple of pages, but it's looking really good so far. So um, I would probably also recommend that one. Cool. Yeah, Sour Heart is so good. Um, I just finished reading Dream of a Divided Field by Yen Yi, which is a super awesome collection of poems. Um, and I like to read multiple books at the same time. So the other book that I'm currently reading is called Healing Justice Lineages, um, which recently came out by Kara Page and Erica Woodland. And it really breaks down um, exactly like what healing justice is, its roots and its practices. And it kind of like, for me, helps chart pathways forward um, in the times that we live in. Um, and then I think the third thing that I like to consider books is also like reading the world around me. Um, so even when like spending time with friends, like reading their hands, um, or I practice energy healing work. And so it's kind of like reading spirit um, or like reading where people have been um, and like the emotions that they're feeling. Um, I like to think of reading broadly. And another question that I had written down, um, I, I started writing the question towards the end of Noreen's reading, and then River, when you started reading, I was like, oh, like, heck yeah, like this, is, this, this question works for, for both readers, I think, very well. Um, you both tell story very well. Um, a lot of these poems are um, dealing in history and in the stories of your families. And, and um, I think River, you, you mentioned um, the, the, I think the word you used was rewriting, like rewriting history into these poems. And from a craft perspective, I didn't know if anything came to mind with that idea of uh, your work as an extension of these stories that you've inherited or the histories that you're trying to retell, if there's anything about um, these, or how do I say this? This is the part of the question I didn't have physically written down. But if anything comes to mind in terms of what about your histories and the stories that you've inherited, uh, are you trying to pass into your poetry? Does, is, this, is this making sense? Um, that's such a big question. <laughs> Um, I feel like, um, I've done a lot of like roots tracing, um, of my own family and 
I think it's in the context of like living in America, um, in empire, and just like being asked, where are you from, like over and over again as you're growing up. Um, and it just seemed like no matter what you say to people, like people already have an image of you or an idea of you, so it doesn't matter what you say, or um, no one is like satisfied with your answer. Um, and so for me, like, I really wanted to know where I come from. And so in my writing, why I write is because the answer to that is like so vast and the process of figuring that out has been so emotional and tumultuous. Um, I write because in the archives, there just like aren't certain histories. Um, I found a genealogical book once of my paternal grandma's last name. And so it's like a it's like a tree that goes back as many generations as possible. And when I looked for my grandma's name, um, the person I was talking to um, told me that the names of daughters aren't recorded, only the names of sons are, um, because those are the people who carry the last name to pass on lineage, like under patriarchal societies, which like really like govern um, a lot of like societies um, on our earth today. Um, and so just like seeing that erasure, like brings me so much rage and anger. And then on top of that, like, the histories of queer and trans people just aren't documented like formally um, in many places. Um, like you couldn't necessarily find the history of of my people like that 500 years ago. And so for me, like poetry is a way to connect with those answers. Um, and I think I bring a lot of my own ancestral and spiritual practices to the act of writing that helps me be in a space in which I can like connect to those people and tell stories like of those people. Um, and uh, I think I've been thinking lately about how what is written on the page is kind of just like the sparks of the life, like the life is so big and so vast and so huge that these like 20 pages of poems, they capture so much. And then at the same time, they're just like sparks of it. Um, and I don't know, that's like my answer to your question. <laughs> and I also think poetry is everything. I love that answer, River, and I'm gonna have a really hard time following that up. Um, I'm still kind of um, thinking about my own answer to this question. I also really love the questions. I think I'm gonna keep thinking about it even after we end this call. But I think for me, something that I've been thinking about as I am like going back to the stories of my parents, um, stories of their childhood, and then also like stories about their early adulthood, something that I'm trying to keep in mind as I write about those stories is like, I guess, how do I write about those things um, in a way that is true to them, but also not telling people's stories for them, but like making us very conscious that this is something that's passing through me and I'm like a messenger of something that is not completely mine, but still connected to me. Um, so I, I think I was thinking about that question when I was writing about my dad, um, the two poems about him that I read today. And so I think that even though the speaker of the poem is not as present as they would be in some of my other work, I think that you can still kind of feel that there's someone else in the poem in addition to the father figure. And I think that's important to me um, because I I think I still don't know how, how or if I want to like inhabit the voices of um, my parents or other people right now that I'm trying to write about. I've seen other people do it really, really well, um, but I think I'm just perhaps not there yet um, in terms of like my relationship to these stories that I'm trying to bring um, to the page. Um, and I think another thing that maybe is not entirely related to the question, um, but something I've been thinking about like kind of along this vein is that when I, when I finish getting everything onto the page for I guess the first 
the first pass of whatever I'm working on. Um, I, I've been trying to, I guess, kind of disconnect myself from whatever poem is birthed. Um, just because once I get everything out, like, I guess like the poem kind of becomes its own thing, right? And so I have, I've been trying to practice like asking myself, like, what does the poem want? Rather than like necessarily what is like autobiographically true. Um, so for some of the poems, I've been changing some like factual things um, to like let in better sounds into the poem. Um, and I also mentioned earlier that like, I will like occlude some facts like to protect the people who actually told me the stories. Um, and so I guess just thinking about things like that are um, kind of the things that are going through my head right now. Um, and so maybe an another answer to the question is that I'm trying to like share the essence of the story while also protecting the people that they're about. Outstanding answers. Um, I loved both of those, both so thoughtful. Um, thank you for that. Um, we have time for one or two questions more if um, folks have anything looming on their minds to ask our wonderful readers. If not, I'm gonna keep rolling. I've, I've, got, I've got infinite questions. Okay, here I go. Um, in terms of imagery, um, and this is a bit of a shot in the dark. So if it doesn't hit, that is okay. And then I just wanna know, I think more generally about the kinds of images y'all are drawn to, but um, Noreen, uh, multiple times I heard in your work, the, the kind of evocation of the moon. I think the first one that I heard was moon-shaped nostril, which is just such a good line. Um, and then River, uh, in your bio, you've, you said it, and then your work also, I think, breathes it, um, like water and the nature of water. Um, maybe Noreen, starting first, if you anything comes to mind about the moon in particular or why it, because I think it was three times that you, that, that moon was brought up, um, about what that means, and then River, the same to you uh, with, with water. I am I'm like grinning at this question because I, I know it's like a stereotype right that poets are like really into the moon and for the longest time I for the longest time I feel like looking at the sky made me kind of sad so I I like didn't really connect with that stereotype about us um but I think like after moving to Mississippi I've just been spending a lot more time outside um I made friends in the physics department at our um at our school and they have like they they have me looking at the sky and it's it's really beautiful um and i'm seeing a lot of things these days that i i'm not accustomed to paying attention to um and i i found that like in all the time that i spend like looking at the sky with my friends now um i don't yet have the vocabulary to describe the stars and so i think perhaps i'm um gravitating toward the moon instead just because it's a little bit a little bit easier for me to find the words for. Um, but I think that, um, yeah, the moon and like other celestial things will perhaps be popping up in my work soon, um, just because I finally found reason to be outside and pay attention to those things. Thanks for sharing that. I too love the moon. Um, and I don't think that you can overdo like having the moon in your poems personally. Um, I think for me, water is, it's the element that I say that um, I can like bend. Um, and I am always trying to swim in bodies of water. Um, even if I'm like kayaking um, on a lake or something, I like wanna jump inside instead of like being on the surface. Um, and I don't know, I'm like, I could say so many things about water. Um, it's 70% of our earth. Um, our bodies are also majority water, even though it doesn't look like it. Um, I think about how when we need to move emotion, like crying is releasing water. Um, 
And so I think in my pieces, I'm kind of just following my intuition with like how to write them and how they're flowing. Um, and I guess sometimes they just wind. Um, I really like what Noreen was saying about how you can let poems like speak for themselves for what they want instead of you as the writer kind of like wanting to be in control of everything. And I think in my work moving forward, I'm just really interested in like quote unquote like hybrid or like experimental forms that don't look like traditional like left margin um, same line stanzas in poetry. Um, and I feel like somehow moving in that direction is like more deeply entering water or ocean. Thank you both. Um, we are about out of time. Um, so the last thing I will ask you all is uh, where can folks find you on the internet or elsewhere? Uh, we already also have links in the chat and on the Facebook uh, for people to click on things. I think perhaps the easiest thing to find my stuff would just be go to, to go to my website, which is my first name, last name.com. So nareenocampo.com. Um, and that can take you to my Instagram, which, where I don't post very much, but I'm still lurking around my Twitter, where I also don't post much, but I'm still around. Um, but the important part is you can check out my chapbook, which was published um, last spring now, um, if you'd be interested in seeing some more of my work. Cool. Um, you can find me on Instagram at remembering our light and also at river transforms, which is for my healing work. Uh, Twitter is at river transforms. Website is my name, riverdandelion.com. Uh, I have a newsletter, tiny letter slash dandelion dreams with a Z. Um, and my forthcoming chapbook is going to be open for pre-order soon, and you can just go to bit.ly slash chapbook with a capital C. Awesome. Thank you both so much for sharing your words, being um, the wonderful creatives that you are with us tonight. Um, and please be on the lookout for our next reading, which will be June 16th with uh, Cindy Zhuyong Oke and uh, Oyo Taiye, um, two extraordinarily talented poets. Um, for everything else, you can follow us on Facebook and you can find their links to the WordPress, which will also have all of the information about our poets uh, right here and the poets of our history. Um, and until next time, stay safe and thank you all for coming.